Hello and welcome to a new Italian PNC video. Today we'll be looking at the map made by Mate888. This is a map that represents the year 10,000 BCE, so before the birth of Christ. This map has both ahistorical uh, narratives, it has probably some history to it, it has some very interesting things, and generally I really want to look at it and uh, let you guys see it so you can judge for yourselves. So first thing we can notice is the map is of course very uh, not precise, or at least I would call it like uh, it doesn't give a lot of information about what is actually going on. As you can see, there's large swaths of the map that are not really covered with information. We only have some cities, some places, some names, but a lot of it is just not really developed upon. And the shapes of the land are, of course, very approximate. And I, I do believe there's some level of abstractness to the shapes of the land. And then again, there's always the fact that this map is, of course, made... I do not think with the intent of telling like a precise version of the world, but it is more like of a storyteller. So it's trying to tell a story. So let's let's start looking at this. Let's start somewhere and then look at this. So the first thing I noticed when scrolling around this map is of course Atlantis. So uh, Atlantis, of course, I don't think I really have to introduce Atlantis, I think everybody's aware about Atlantis, but if you're not, it's basically a landmass that was believed by the ancient Greeks, or at least by uh, Plato, was telling, um, was talking about basically something that happened tens of thousands of years before himself, and he recalled a time where Atlantis was an empire that ruled over much of the Mediterranean, and that uh, tried to capture Athens, which um, the Athenians managed to rebel against, and eventually the fact that the Atlantic Empire, or the Emperor of Atlantis, managed to uh, reach overreach to the point of trying to take Athens was enough for the gods of ancient Greece to punish the Atlanteans and submerge the uh, land of Atlantis. So that is where the myth, I guess, or the story of Atlantis, history of Atlantis, comes from. We do not have any other sources, and if we did have other sources, they were probably in the liber uh, library of Alexandria, which unfortunately, as many of you already know, uh, went up into flames around the time uh, of the Roman conquest. So, basically, we do not have any other sources about Atlantis, and after that, it was all speculation about where it actually could go, where it actually where it was, where it used to be, and so on and so forth. So one thing you can already notice by this map is the fact that uh, the actual landmasses are very weird and of course they don't really resemble the ones on our own world or at least not the ones we have right now because of course 10,000 years before the birth of Christ, in our words almost 12,000 years from now, uh, the landmasses of Earth were actually really vastly different, especially when it comes to Europe. I don't know if it, this is completely accurate, but it is at least definitely somewhat accurate to what it was in time. So some things I want to make you guys notice are some things that I, I'm sure that were real. It's things like the Caspian and the Aral Seas, which now is almost gone, being united at some point in time. Then there is the matter of the Caspian Sea, which used to be uh, divided from the rest of the Mediterranean Sea. And eventually the Caspian Sea was united with the Mediterranean, since today we have um, Constantinople or Istanbul right here, which divides, uh, which I mean, which unites the Caspian Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. So that's something. And talking about the Black Sea, there are a lot of historic theories that try to explain how all these people in ancient history, so the Greeks, the Anatolians, the Canaanites, or the Jews, the, um, the Egyptians, so a lot of populations had the myth of the flood, the flood myth, so mud floods. I'm sure you guys are already uh, well acknowledged to this, but to those that don't know, uh, almost all civilizations in the old world, or at least most of them, have at least one myth or one story that tells that at some point in history, for some reason or another, the gods, or god, in the case of biblical uh, history, uh, decided to flood the earth and try to uh, eliminate humanity from it. 
because of its sins, or because of some other trouble it caused. And one of the things that happened in history, uh, which we are sure about, that might have actually inspired all these populations to create this myth, is the um, flooding of the um, Black Sea. Since before the Black Sea was mostly land, so how, uh, like we can see here, a lot of it that today is not land, was land, so more lands near the Danube River, more lands near what is now the Crimean Peninsula, uh, more lands right here, and more lands light right here. So in the Caucasus, Northern Caucasus, Anatolia, Anatolia was united with the rest of Europe, it wasn't a peninsula, and a lot of populations seem to have inhabited this area, it was pretty, probably fertile, thanks to the uh, lake or sea, I mean it, it is a sea, but at that point it was a lake in some fashion or another. And when the Mediterranean Sea um, just started uniting the two um, seas, so the floods... Okay, so wait. The reason the Mediterranean Sea levels went up was because the global temperature was going up. So the glaciers were melting, and that caused two major events in the scope of this map. One was the fact that this was gone, so the, land, the amount of land in Europe was diminishing fastly and at terrible amounts of speed, which caused the division between Britain, Ireland and the rest of Europe, as well as the creation of the Scandinavian Peninsula, the finno scandi Peninsula, the you know, Denmark, the Little Islands, the Baltics and so on and so forth. Well, we do have evidence of the Mediterranean remaining already existing for a long time before it. So, the difference was that the Black Sea and the Mediterranean were two divided seas. So, the people that inhabited the shores of the Black Sea were not aware that this entire area was starting to uh, be, you know, just flooded with water. And eventually, this happened very fastly, way faster than any other part of the world, or at least in the known world, and this connection was created. So basically what happened that was that eventually, because of how it worked, the Mediterranean Sea uh, created what is now the Strait of the Bosporus, and there was this division that divided the Anatolian Peninsula from the Greek part of the Balkans and the, you know, it wasn't Greek yet, but you know, I mean, just the Balkans in general. So Europe from Asia, in another world. And this division caused a flooding of the Black Sea at speeds and unimaginable for the living inhabitants of the land, which, in other words, caused the inhabitants of the Black Sea to think they were being punished uh, because of something by the gods. So this is probably one of the reasons that we have so many of these flood myths, because of course the in, uh, inhabitants of the Black Sea had to spread out. Since their homes were being flooded, there's a theory that they basically spread out from the Black Sea coasts to the rest of Europe and um, ancient Mesopotamia, which would explain why all these populations, both in the Levant, the uh, Fertile Crescent, uh, Anatolia, Egypt, um, most of Europe, even parts of the Middle East and the Eastern Middle East, have this uh, creation myth and the flood myth being very similar to one another. So that's one of the explanations. So, a thing I'm noticing here is that this map represents things like this, so like the Black Sea being way smaller, not united with the Mediterranean, pretty correctly, but then we have weirder things like Atlantis, not like being a separate landmass, but actually being a non-submerged part of Africa. So, for those that do not know, um, in this map, the continent, or at least island of Atlantis, is shown as what now is today a real part of Africa, which is, I think, in Mauritania, so the country in the uh, area near West, Sah West Sahara, and basically there's this structure, or at least some people think it's a structure, some people think it's just a natural occurrence of an eye, which is basically some very weird looking thing that you can see even from the sky, from the, uh, literally, if you're on a plane, you can see it, and it's like this circular thing, I will just put the image now, and this thing here, some people think it's the Atlantis we now 
are talking about. This is interesting because some calculations made it so that it seems that right, abo right about after 10,000 BCE, it did somewhat get flooded, which would corroborate the myth of Atlantis. So if Atlantis existed, there's a high chance it actually is here. So in modern day Mauritania. But then how is it that there are no real like solid evidences, like uh, artifacts or constructs that exist in this eye. Also, Atlantis is described exactly like the structure that is the eye, so it's even more eerie as a occurrence that these two descriptions really come together with each other. So Atlantis in this map is observed both as a state and as a civilization, which I assume has an empire of some sort. Because Atlantis is the only actual like state that has the, like, the name like this, like underlined and in uh, all full caps. And then we have a lot of territories here that are always named Colony of. So, in Atlantis the I is the capital, and we have a couple more towns, Atlish, Asperish, Ka Astarish, and Apensi. And then we have what appears to be colonies of Atlantis. So we have col a colony of Adrarish, which apparently is near Adrarish, uh, which is the city. Then we have the Adrar mainland, which I, I assume to be... Wait, this is all a single colony. Right, wait. Okay, wait. I figure I figure out the borders. So these blue uh, dotted lines are borders, and since this is 10,000 BCE, of course borders won't be as perfect and as uh, guarded as they are nowadays. But they do give us some uh, inform uh, information about where the domain of Atlantis ends and where it starts. So the Adrar mainland is near the Atlas mountain chains of north um, northwestern Africa. So this is uh, modern-day Morocco, this is modern-day Algeria, and that is modern-day um, Tunisia. This is modern-day Iberia, so Spain in the modern day. And it appears that this entire area from the Garamish uh, city here to the this river apparently, to this river here, is all the colony of Adrarish, which is, I assume, part of the Atlantean Empire or Atlantic Empire. Then we have another colony here, more northern, that expands from this river to this other city right here in the parts that are known as Gaul in ancient times, but modern day France. And it's called the Colony of Euskaran. I am not sure what that is referring to, but I find it interesting that we have some cities with names such as Urun, Otsoar, then for the Colony of Other Rish we have Baal Ansi. Uh, Zibazi, Refsi, Iratesh, Utun, Safasi. Even have Kabilish, which just sounds like Kabylia, the region of Algeria, but I'm pretty sure that the region of Al Algeria is uh, like here, so might be just a coincidence. Anyways, we also have something interesting here. We have some wild men. It's referred to these patches of land that apparently are just too uh, tribal to be governed as a state, and these wild men are both here, near these mountains in the southern, or hills in the southern part of modern-day Spain, in the colony of Adarish, and then we have them right in the middle of Iberia, in this area right here. After the Pyrenees, this mountain chain very right here, we have a client state here, of Balceron, which sounds like Barcelona, but I'm going to assume it's another coincidence, because we also have Balarish here, so it probably doesn't have anything to do with it. And it's probably once again a client state of Atlantis, which would make sense because if I remember correctly, in Plato's myth of Atlantis, he did mean that some populations weren't directly controlled by Atlantis, but they were just uh, heavily influenced by Atlantis, which would be explained through the client state of Balseron. And we have the Gentilac clans here. I'm not really sure what those are, I'm going to assume these are independent clans, but once again, you can see how 
civilization and non-civilization really depends completely on the existence of Atlantis as their overlord. So in the places that Atlantis does not own, there aren't many states, at least I don't see them. There are some here, some states right here in the north of Europe, or at least in the northwest of Europe. Uh, this is, I'm going to assume, where Britain would be, and this is definitely the coast of modern-day Ireland. We have the Tin Folk tribes, which just corroborates what I said, because the Tin in Europe in the ancient times came from Britain, or at least most of it came from the Scilly Islands in the uh, southern part of Britain. We have two states here, or at least this is definitely a state, Sarpapon, which appears to be some state that originated from its city, so some kind of um, enlarged city-state. So the city, capital of Sarbapon is Sarbapon. Then we have this one, which is Taraskal. And Taraskal has a single mentioned city, which is Kairn. I think Kairn might be the equivalent of Sin, Kain in uh, France. I'm not sure though. Also, I think this river is the... Yeah, I'm like 100% sure that this is the... Tamis River. And this is the Rhine. Yeah, this is definitely the Rhine River. And we can see that the Rhine River divides the folk of this area between the Tin Folk tribes, which I assume are the ones that trade tin with the Atlanteans, and then with the Duggerman tribes, which I assume are the creators of weapons for the rest of Europe. In the lands of Fomor, we have vassals of the Fomor. Not sure what the Fomor are, since they aren't really explained. And here we have some three Nemedian tribes and vassals of the snake. Not sure what those are. Um, there's a lot of information here that I'm not gonna be sure about. Okay, so this is interesting. If we go to the east of the tundra, of course, when it comes to climate, you have to understand that this is probably near the end or still in the Ice Age. So this entire part of Europe, the reason which is uh, why there are like very little cities, very little states, is because of the fact that, of course, it's literally all in ice. So the parts that are actually inhabitable are very few and sparse, which is why this is a tundra in the climate scale. Here we have Thule, or I'm going to assume that is what this is, Thol, Thol probably which has some sort of Greek-sounding cities, Pilkodomos, which is a Greek endonym, I think that is how you say it. So it might be a Greek colony of some sort, or a proto-Greek colony, Mycenaean colony? Wait, that can be right, the Indo-Europeans haven't spawned yet? I'm not sure, that is very interesting actually. What, what could create a state that sounds like an Indo-European state? without the Indo-Europeans ever expanding. That is very interesting. Also, we have Tuagarfa and the furthest north in the Aro, which assumes to be the position where the hole that can be used to traverse the entirety of Earth is. So Agarfa, for those that do not know, is a theory and a myth or reality, depending upon you, where there is some sort of hole in Earth that manages itself as some sort of portal to the inside of Earth. And this inside of Earth is hollow, so Earth is not filled with the liquid magma and other weird stuff that the scientists have believed to be. But instead, there are civilizations inside of Earth. And apparently here we have Tuagarfa and the first north, so it means that somewhere here in the ice there might be the hole. But then again, if this was an area that was about to be filled with water from the um, floods, then the hole might be, might not be here anymore, which would explain why there is no access to Agarfa right here nowadays. Anyways, we have Thulin or Folan merchant kingdoms here, which appear to be spawning from this river right here. Uh, this is a river in modern-day Poland, but I'm not sure which one it is. Um, I don't remember. Maybe Older River. I think the Older is somewhere west of it, actually. So I'm not sure what this is. Anyways, here we go to the Carpathian Mountains, where we can see some other mentions of these wildmen. 
And then finally we go back to the Mediterranean where there are uh, some... Actually, before the Mediterranean we have the Danube River where there are some kingdoms apparently, the Kaleka kingdoms, which have established some towns or cities. One of them being Vashil in modern-day Bulgaria, and one would be uh, Namas, which is in modern-day uh, Romania, if I think. I think it's modern-day Romania. Then here we have the first actual, like, empire that is not Atlantean, and that is the Empire of Hatta. So, this is completely um, a theory, I'm not sure of what I'm going to say, but Hatta sounds a lot like Hatti, which was the name for the uh, Hittites that they gave themselves. So, it is possible that this is showing the primordial uh, ancestral homeland of the Hittites, Hittites before they actually um, went all the way to their modern homeland, which is, of course, Anatolia. So the Hittite Empire, for those that don't know, was an ancient um, history empire that was established in the core of Anatolia and expanded to encompass much of the Anatolian Peninsula and it was in a state of constant warfare, or at least near constant warfare, with the Egyptians and the people of Mesopotamia, so the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and even sometimes with the um, uh, Jews, the Canaanites. So that is very interesting. Also, we can see that the uh, mention of the Empire of Atta also has some cities, which are Nemie, Atta itself, and then Pelbiria, or Pelbria. Pel Pelbria, probably. Also, something interesting is that, if in case you didn't notice, this is exactly the Dnieper River in modern day Ukraine. And this uh, weird thing here is not a simple peninsula, but is what uh, eventually would become the Crimean Peninsula. The borders of the Empire of Hatta also border some other states, but not defined by precise borders, but by natural boundaries. So these mountain chains right here in the north, or hill chains I believe, since there are not really mountain chains since this, is the Eurasian Plain. And then here with the Dnieper River, we probably have the borders of the Chorus Kingdoms, uh, which is capital are Holkis. And then we have the former kingdoms in the west of the Chorus Kingdoms, whose capital is Furun. Once again, don't know what these are. Chorus sounds another time like a Greek word, and former kingdoms just sounds like a generic name the states that would form, would take upon themselves. They probably export grain to the rest of these states here, the Emperor of Tehata, the Chorus Kingdoms and the Kaleka Kingdoms, which makes sense since even today the territories of Ukraine, Poland and Belarus are all very grain heavy and they export a lot of grain to the rest of the world. Then here we have the Kingdom of Colchis, right here on the Black Sea coast. Uh, this is a like well-renowned kingdom in ancient history, but I'm not sure if it would have existed all the way back to 10,000 BCE. But that said, the Kingdom of Colchis was a kingdom where the original Georgians uh, lived. Uh, in a video I made in the past, I explained that the Kingdom of Colchis was many times misidentified on its actual position. The Greeks that came after, of course, this era, thought it to be like a very wild tribal area whose culture was not compatible with the one of the Greeks and the description of the people of the Colchis was very weird. Some people would describe them as fair-skinned, as many other Europeans would be, but some other people would describe them as um, darker-skinned with many hair. So that takes upon even a mystery of what the actual inhabitants of the Colchis were. Could they have been not from this part of the world? We can never know, at least not nowadays. Then we have more wild men here, north of the Caucasus mountain range. And beneath the Volga rivers, we have the Haldal Star City and the kingdoms of the Horse Lords, the steppe as the um, climate region. That is, this is next to the Tundra. We have one city here for the Kingdom of the Lords Lords, which is Perseirus. Uh, probably pronounced like that. 
Interestingly enough, I think this might be a stretch. The Kingdom of the Horse Lords are not really feasible, at least not to our current knowledge. There isn't much evidence that it supports that the people that domesticated the horse all the way back to 10,000 BCE, but if you don't agree with me, you're um, free to tell me in the comments and explain why that is. I would be interested in knowing how the Kingdom of the Horse Lords came to be before the horse uh, was actually domesticated, or if I'm just wrong, and the Horse Lords already managed to domesticate the horse in 10,000 BCE. Then we have a couple more cities here in the uh, coast of the Caspian Sea, like Tagush, Sarf, Azrai, and Kasp, which probably is the reason the name the, of the sea is, of course, Caspian. Finally, here, in what is now the remaining parts of the Aral Sea, we have Zibar. Going back to here, so in Anatolia, we have the Kingdom of Wilusa here, which apparently is still before the uh, division of Anatolia and the rest of Europe, which means that the Kingdom of Wilusa would be on modern-day Constantinople and lands that would be eventually flooded, such as the cities of Pirum and Wilusa. Uh, we have like solid evidence, or at least some sort of solid evidence, of the existence of the Kingdom of Wilusa, but our position is not certain. If I'm sure that I'm sure that it is in the Anatolian Peninsula, but I might have um I think it might be in the south of it. My like here. I could be wrong. I, I think I, I made some research about the Kingdom of Wilusa. Uh, funnily enough, and this I'm sure will be very interesting for all of you, it appears to be that the name Wilusa is actually the reason that the continent of Asia is called Asia. Uh, Wilusa itself was originally the name for this kingdom and the ancient pre-Greek population of this area called these guys Wilusins, and since they only knew that on the other side of their uh, Aegean Sea there were the Wilusins, they would call all the populations east of Greece, or at least modern day Greece, Wilusins, which eventually Wilusa, Lusa, Lusia would eventually transfer into Asia, or Asia, as it is in Greece. And this would eventually be the name. To describe not just the Wilusans or the Hittites or the Anatolians, but the entirety of the continent east of Europe, which at that point was not perfectly defined. But anyways, here on this map, the Kingdom of Wilusa has both parts of Europe and both parts of Asia, so it serves as some kind of uh, merchant state, I would assume. Then we have some more states that are client states of the uh, Atlantic Empire and the east of what we recognize as Iberia, we have the uh, client states of Ra Rasanim. No, wait, that is not the case. These guys, okay, so the, the, the south of Italy, the south of modern day Italy, apparently was an Atlantean a colony or at least client states. So in places like Sicily. Uh, Malta, uh, Calabria, Apulia, and some places like these, they appear to be parts of the Atlantic Empire, at least in an influence kind of way, since they are client states. On the other side, the province or colony of Adrar expands way into the uh, eastern parts of the Mediterranean, as they do have territories all the way into Wehesh, Weshesh, sorry, which is uh, of course modern day Libya, and Garam, which is modern day also Libya but also other states. These are of course Dune, so uh, desert, Sahara, and then Savannah, so of course that is the climate we are looking at since this is of course Africa. Very interesting. And one thing I found extremely interesting is the fact that Atlantis 
is shown also as the one that owns not only all these territories in Africa and parts of Europe, but also Egypt. So Egypt is shown as a colony called the colony of Kamat, which you might ask, well, what is Kamat? Well, Kamat is actually just Kemet, which was the name the Egyptians referred to themselves, or the land was referred as Kemet, not Egypt. Egypt is a Greek name for Egypt. Uh, in Kamat, so modern Egypt, we can see it's very likely developed compared to what it would be eventually uh, developed into in the ancient age. So like 5,000 to 4,000 to 3,000 to 2,000 to even like modern day. And we have some couple cities, Akenish, Menepsi and Abadish. None of these are cities that are well known. Menepsi might have had some historical records, because I feel like I've seen this name. It reminds me of Memphis, but it might not be the same thing. Uh, we have some uh, depictions of pyramids here. So it is interesting to think that the Egyptians already created the pyramids all the way to with um, 10,000 BC. Or even more interesting would be to hypothesize that the creators of the uh, pyramids were not the Egyptians themselves, but actually the Atlanteans that colonized them. Which would explain a lot, since the Atlanteans would of course be the most advanced civilization in the world at that point, to hold such an uh, uh, impressive stretch of territory, not comparable to any um, ancient empire. So we even have client states here, in the middle of Africa. I assume this large sea of some sort would be the Lake Chad, which is the lake uh, in the middle of Africa that nobody really reminds themselves of because nowadays it's basically almost gone but in the years of 10,000 BC it was considered a mega lake something almost like a sea such as the Casp Caspian and Black Seas and in this case the actual map does not show anything beneath this, I mean not, not beneath that, but beneath like this line here for Africa so I had to fill it in. So I think now that I'm actually looking at this, I'm pretty sure this is not uh, a sea that goes on for like this, but it probably um, closes itself right here or something like that. And then it is just a lake. And the client states here, we have client states of Tamguan and Nijema for the Atlanteans. The Black Kingdoms are literally called Black Kingdoms because of, you know, uh, the scan of the population that lives there. So we have the Iwood city, Yakub or Yakob. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you will understand the reference. And then we have states like the Kingdom of Tachad, which of course, once again, Lake Chad, Kingdom of Tachad, the actual territory was known as Chad with the T before, so it makes sense. It's of course established through the capital, Tachad itself, and then has a lot of cities here like Gadra, Tarankish, Zjamansi, Folish, and Asi. Uh, I'm not sure which, which uh, states Ur is, so this island here. I'm going to assume it's probably one of the territories of Tachad. Oh wait, no, never mind. It's part of the Urishan Empire, which would be located in modern-day coasts of Western Africa. So Guinea, I would assume, and Ur seems to be just the name that is used for the states or the parts of territories that are ruled by the Urishan Empire. So we have the Urishan Empire here and this island of Sigawi. We have the Urishan here and the island or territory peninsula of Kadinga. And in these islands right here, Bindaka, Bunyakoro, and of course the mainland of the Urishan Empire, with the capital, Jineme, and Cholanga, Batao, and Sarawe as city-states. I mean, sorry, not city-states, just cities. Here, to the south of the Black Kingdoms, we have the forests of the Pygmies, which makes a lot of sense, in case you don't know, before the modern-day native population of Africa, of the majority of Africa, came to place, which are the Bantu populations, a lot of places in Africa were originally the Khoisan populations, which famous trait of the Khoisan populations was the fact that they were pygmies, basically. A lot of them were pygmies at least, 
and that made them very very weak compared to the uh, Bantu populations that eventually came to be the holders of most of Sub-Saharan Africa, and so is the case today. But before they actually expanded to the south of Africa, they were the holders of the majority of southern Africa, and even the parts that we mentioned earlier, so the Urishan Empire and Kingdom of the Chad. But looking at the time of the map, 10,000 BC, I'm going to assume these places are already Bantu majority, as for the Black Kingdoms. Although these could be Nilotic Kingdoms, such as the Kingdom of Kush, which is very well known in history, we have a lot of them, uh, very well known, even like the Kingdom, kingdom of Mero, or Marwe as it's named here, which seems to be just part of a city which is part of the Kingdom of Kush. Kingdom of Kush survived for a long time, uh, eventually becoming like one of the main antagonists of an independent Egypt, and it would conduct wars against Egypt, and I, I think some dynasties of the ancient Egyptian uh, pharaohs were actually Kushitic in origin, because of the conquest from Kush of Egypt in a point of its instability. So that is interesting to know. Here we have the Empire of Sham, which seems to be in modern day Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia and Sudan, but I'm going to assume that the homeland of the Empire of Sham is in fact the Abyssinian Plain, so the heartland of the Horn of Africa, and it appears to be in a place where the Red Sea doesn't really go and connect with the rest of the Arab Sea. So interestingly enough, we see a situation where much like the Black Sea, the uh, Red Sea, which is the one that Moses traversed when he came to the Holy Land, was is not actually uh, you know, united with the Arab Sea. Which means that it's basically useless, because as you might know, it's a lot salty in the Red Sea. So this is probably only useful as a traversable part of the world. So it ships, but it's probably not very good for, you know, life near it. Which is why we don't really have many cities on its coasts, like differently from the Black Sea. We have only the city of Mag here, and the north, uh, of course, this would be Arabia, Hayyaj. And then we have the city of Manalk, which is part of the Empire of Sham. The borders of the Empire of Sham are very close to what like the Empire of Aksum would look like in ancient history. And then we have the um, Yemeni mountain chains, I would assume, as the rest of the border. So this is basically where the capital of Yemen would be the more populated part of Yemen, while this part of course is more desert in nature. There's more information here in what is now Arabia, like of course we have the climate information, so desert, there's literally nothing. <laughs> so we have the desert called the desert of Iram, and here we have the Dafari cities, but I find very interesting the fact that these are like with little uh, populations here, called Serpent Men and Jackal Men, of course I believe these are just some uh, names that are given to them, I don't really think these are like actual serpent people or jackal people, but it's interesting to know that these deserts were mythicized. I think I'm going to go over the Dafari cities, which are Dafar, Arnoir, Masakata, Dar al Gam, Mashgar, Mariana, and uh, Peras, Liyan, and Ilam. Interesting, interesting. So these seem to be independent city-states that thrive through the trade that comes to Mesopotamia, so the Near East, from the Indies, Upper Lemuria, and so on, but these are all to do in another video. I want, don't want to extend it too long, of course. Uh, north of the area here, we have some rivers which do not exist anymore in the Arab Peninsula. So if these are rivers, they might have just dried out in the time after the last ice age, which would make sense since, you know, hotter climate, worse chances to have rivers in your land. This is the colony of Najad, which is still part of the Atlantean Empire. So you just gotta understand just how big the Atlantean Empire here is as they start right here in the far west of Africa, 
and extend all the way into all of North Africa, much of West Africa, and then go all the way here to the colony of Najad, modern day Najad, and even to the colony of Babel, which would be the Tower of Babel from biblical history, I would assume. Well, this region right here, that goes from the mountain chains of Persia to the south, is probably called Elam, just like in history. And then this Parask, this city here, which I mentioned earlier, Parask, is probably where the name Persia comes from, as we know Fars as the name of the city or the region here. Fars uh, eventually was transformed by the ancient Greeks into Pars, and Pars was explained to like the entire Persian Empire. Pars became Persia. Persian and eventually so Parsg is probably the origin of the name of Persia uh, There's like a lot of evidence for this. We also have a lot of kingdoms and states here in the Near East But before we go uh, Check them out. I want to quickly talk about what I realized here We have uh, another Empire here the Minoan Empire once again, this seems a bit of far-fetched because of the fact that the Minoans did exist but I don't think it was in literally 10,000 BC. I think it was way uh, after. But it is true that in 10,000 BC, the same population that lived in the island of Crete probably was of Minoan stock. I don't think there was any other major population change. I mean, it might have been from like the Near East, but I don't think there might be that the Minoans were the uh, inhabitants of the Cretan Islands. I mean, in this case, it's just one, one island, and these are islands. But the important thing is, we have the Minoan Emperor that owns part of, you know, starts from Crete, from the city of Knusset, and then owns part of the Anatolian Peninsula here, or in this case, just the Anatolian part of the world, and then over even owns uh, what would be the archipelagos of the Aegean Sea, but since we are with higher landmasses, we can see that most of it are united in a single major landmass called Lemnet. Then we have some little islands here, which will be Rhodes and the islands near the Dodecanese in the Aegean Sea, and they even own some parts of Greece, so this coast here in the west of uh, Greece, even the uh, island of Kirkiria, that's probably the right name. Then they own what would eventually become the Peloponnesus uh, Peninsula. And then they own what would become... Well, it's both Macedonia and both uh, Thessalia, but realistically it's just land that eventually would become just islands or flooded lands. Finally, you have some city-states here. The Pelasgian city-states. The Pelasgians were a very ancient population, pre-Indo-European population, so it would be accurate for them to be here in 10,000 BCE. And the Pelasgian population used to live in modern day Greece and parts of the Balkans. And as you can see here, they established many different cities like Etol, Laras, Peon, Arzog, which seems to be in the major part of the Balkans, so in modern day Albania. And they do have some pyramids here, which wouldn't be too crazy considering that these states would be very rich thanks to the trade with the rest of the uh, near East. They even have Athenas here, so like Proto-Athens, and uh, some other states and cities here like Darakol, Mertish, and Squilur, all parts of the princely states of the Pelasgian city-states. One final thing for this video will be the mention of the fact that there are Cyclopes here in the modern-day island of Cyprus, and I don't know if this is a play on the name Cyprus, with Cyclops being similar, or if there are actual Cyclops on the island of Cyprus, since we do know that in the voyages of the ancient Greeks there would be mentions of Cyclops living near them, so near Greece, might be in Cyprus, I thought it was mainly in the west, so like in this part of the world, but I might be wrong, honestly. 10,000 BC, you never know, and the Greeks aren't even here, so I don't really know how it would be that the Cyclops were here, not sure. Anyways, I think this will be it for this video. We went through like basically the entirety of Africa, most of Europe. Don't think we finished all of it. I mean, we might have. Uh, we did ignore a part of Italy, so I might go back to it. 
in the next video. And just so you know, uh, I'm going to continue this series if I only if I receive some support from you guys. So let's get this video like to 4,000 or 5,000 views in like three, four days. And if you uh, do actually support this video, I will continue and make more episodes on this map that I do find very fascinating. And yeah, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Uh, leave a comment in the description so the video gets more algorithm boosts. And subscribe to the channel. Goodbye.